Welcome back everyone, Quistini here with another video about the worst legendary lords for every race in Total War Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires. For the High Elves, it is Teclis, by far. Now, one of the problems for Teclis is not that he's such a bad legendary lord, it's that every other legendary lord for his entire race is substantially better than him. Even free DLC legendary lords like Alifanar or Emric, Emric focusing on dragons, having super powerful dragons, and Alifanar being the master ambusher, or really the Skaven legendary lord for the High Elves. That's really what Alifanar is. If we look at Teclis, what does he offer? He gets a diplomatic uh, relations benefit with men, High Elves, Wood Elves, Lizardmen, and Dwarves. Not too bad, except it doesn't really matter in a lot of ways unless you're talking about uh, Krokgar. If you're thinking you're gonna have a friendship with Tic-Tac-Toe, be prepared to be disappointed. I don't know what's up with Tic-Tac-Toe, he's just bizarre like that. He does get allied recruitment cost minus 50%, okay, not too bad, not too shabby. Plus 5 uh, recruit rank for Lore Masters of Hoof and Archmage, Mages and Archmages, so he can get Archmage Lords at a higher level than anyone else, not too bad as a benefit and especially at the start of a campaign if you can get um, an archmage that has the ridicule trait that is certainly going to help you in your campaign because basically the ridicule trait doesn't really matter and then you get a minus 25 percent recruitment cost for sword masters of hoof and phoenix units which don't really matter all that much as units because, well, there's much better units that you can recruit in a High Elven campaign, even if you have no DLC whatsoever. Now, Teclis gets Preeminent Mage as a Lord skill, which increases his uh, Winds of Magic Power Reserve change plus 30% when increasing. And he gets a bunch of uh, uh, Winds of Magic benefits, as well as Ward Save for Lore Masters and Mages, all characters. So this is affecting the heroes and his faction. He also gets a bunch of other benefits, uh, crucially greater arcane conduit, wins a magic power reserve capacity plus 5, wins a magic power reserve capacity plus 10 for his army. So he's getting a lot of that, as well as a miscast chance. Teclis is all about casting a lot of spells very, very quickly and getting an enormous number of effects through it. Because he has Shield of Shaf Safri, Kindle Flame, Metal Shifting, Rolling Skies, Life Bloom, Smoke and Mirrors, Life Leeching, Wild Heart Exorcism. He's not like someone like, say, Drazov, who casts one big, really powerful spell, though he does certainly have Chain Lightning. Rather, what he is going, he, what he does in his campaign, what he's really all about is spamming Flock of Doom. It's not the most ex exciting magic usage. I mean, I would say, like, in terms of, like, just having an impact on a battle, unless you want to spend half an hour just ca casting Flock of Doom to win the battle, getting a mage of lore of high magic is actually a better choice. Or having, an, uh, having a mage like that in your army, because you're still going to get all those wins of magic benefits. I mean, obviously, you do want to get all of these effects. That's certainly undeniably beneficial, but you're just going to spam Flock of Doom while the real damage dealer is going to come uh, from another mage that you attach to his army. Now, the big problem in Teclis' campaign, however, isn't his lord effects or his faction effects, it's his starting position and what he has to deal with. His short campaign victory conditions require him to deal with Sarfaral and uh, Tsinch, basically deal with Kairos. Now, the issue with dealing with all of that is the cast wastes are a genuine nightmare to deal with. You can deal with Kairos pretty quickly, but guess what? You're gonna have to also deal with these fellows right here, the Bubonic Swarm. And then you're still gonna have all these demonic factions to tackle. I mean, I suppose if you're willing to invest in it and have a really, really slow campaign start, you could take, all of, uh, take over all of this territory and give it to Oxyatl and then make a pretty formidable alliance with Oxyatl. But it really isn't a campaign worth playing as I see it. Even if you overcome the early game situation, it's not really a challenge, I would say. Like, defeating Kairos is not so difficult if you just rush him very, very quickly. Um, rather, uh, uh, rather the problem in this campaign... Okay, you deal with that early game challenge, you deal with the Skaven over here, you deal with the Lizardmen over here, you deal with Tic-Tac-Toe, you make an alliance with Krakar. What then? What... What kind of exciting gameplay are you going to have in this campaign? This is the problem with certain Legendary Lords. They might have an interesting early game, 
Emmerich can have that, but late game scaling, they just fall behind compared to other legendary lords. It's not like you can take Emery in this campaign because the desert is uninhabitable. I guess you could come over here to the north and make an alliance with Cetra and wipe out Volkmar and give him, uh, give that territory to Cetra. Or you can make a deal with Forek if that's uh, your prerogative over there. Uh, but really, you end up in a situation where a lot of the terrain north of you is actually limited, the cast wastes are limited, and fun fact, you actually have to waste your time in this campaign uh, sailing over here to the eastern colonies to wipe out this faction because you actually want this territory to achieve your long campaign victory conditions. Like, for someone who's supposed to be a world wanderer, you only get temperate islands, savanna, and jungle. I mean, I guess you could decide to invade Illustria, if you so desire, but by the time you actually get to Illustria, it's likely going to be under the control of, Lizard, of the Lizardmen. And unless you want to end up fighting both Axiatl and Kairos for the sake of the Southern Cast Waste, it is probably a better decision to not pick a fight with Illustria. You can't even take the Frozen Territory, which is a bit of a shame. And this campaign just doesn't make sense either for Teclis as a character, because Teclis is supposed to be a world wanderer that helps out the factions of order. He's the one who taught humans magic, and esta helped establish the colleges of magic and the empire. Honestly, I would say that uh, Teclis being in the middle of the empire would make a lot more sense and certainly make an imperial campaign a lot better. Maybe you should be a horde faction, though we've seen how well those can work, which is not well at all at the moment. I mean... Right now, the only pure horde army that we have, and not even fully, is um, is Nakai. And he, what the developers decided to do in Nakai is just basically put him here in a corner, just so he's not he doesn't have a completely miserable campaign. But I do feel like Teclis would work a lot better if he was uh, if he was like really like Oxyatl. Believe it or not, Oxyatl has the campaign mechanics that Teclis would actually need because. That's because what Axiotl is doing, teleporting around the world, helping the forces of order fight the forces of chaos, is exactly the kind of thing that Teclis should be doing in the lore, uh, in the game, from a lore perspective, and what he's not doing in the game. For Kislev, it is Sarina Katrin. It is funny when you start her campaign and she has this little line over here that all the motherland stands behind her. Uh, the motherland actually hates her guts in a lot of ways, like her, the southern oblast has been occupied by chaos, the eastern oblast uh, is div is burned to the ground, or at least one settlement is burned to the ground. Prague despises her, yes, Prague the, for the mainline fortress between Kislev and chaos. Kostaltin considers her a heretic, so which part of Kislev exactly stands behind Katrin? The tier 1 settlement, provincial capital of Kislev, that she can't even turn into a tier 2 settlement on turn 1? I mean, there are certain factions that start with the tier 1 settlement, but the advantage they have is they start with a population surplus point, and so they can turn this into a tier 2 settlement. Let's not, let's ignore the fact that Castalton starts with a tier 2 provincial capital, but what about Boris Ursus, right? The best legendary lord of Kisav. Yeah, Boris Ursus is pretty much a horde army. He doesn't give a crap about settlements because he's got a far more powerful starting army than most factions dream of getting like at turn 20 or so. Over here with like these seven units and a hero that gives replenishment and heavily armored units. Like Boris Ursus literally cannot resolve every single legendary lord around him. The only one that might uh, that might require him to put some genuine effort in is if he actually makes some his way to Grimgore and ends up having to fight Grimgore with a full wa. That would require some effort, but he probably would win that fight as well. So I'm curious what the fan fiction Catherine has read that she believes that uh, all of the motherland stands behind her. Now in realms of chaos, absolutely, Catherine could get all three major Kislevite cities, could conquer large swaths of the empire, could make uh, could uh, become the most powerful legendary lord of Kislev. Boris Ursus and Gustavton was were playing second fiddle compared to Catherine in realms of chaos, but in immortal empires, she is pretty awful. She's the only legendary lord of Kislev that doesn't start with a hero. You actually have to earn it. And that's not necessarily so easy, because all the settlements here in the Southern Oblast, with the exception of Etevo, but all of them, when you take them over, are going to be tier 1 settlements. Now, faction wide effects, she gets an Ice Core training, duration of minus 2 turns, and she does start with Ice Sculpting, so she can start getting an Ice Mage from turn 1. But it's still gonna take 6 turns. 6 turns in the early game, it is a pretty substantial amount of time. 
She gets six control in her settlements. Yay, she gets control, which doesn't really matter in a lot of ways, and certainly not for Kislev. Uh, she, in fact, getting rebellions might be beneficial for Kislev because they might be able to get devotion if it is in an area with high caste corruption. Though, if you're getting a Kislev rebellion as Kislev, that sucks because you're going to lose supporters. So it's not great, but to be honest, the whole control situation doesn't really matter. Besides, there's a mod that helps with that, so it's like Katrin's uh, control benefit is irrelevant. Even if you're playing completely on mod, but put a mod in, it's going to be even more relevant. And in the long term, it's really worthless because the whole supporter system gives you that much control. I mean, I guess Katrin could achieve 100 control, but looking at the benefits that Kislev gets at a higher level of control, they're not really that great. Kislev has pretty decent growth in their campaign. She has the worst starting army. I mean, she does have these armor Cossars and the Ice Guard, but that, but these uh, regular Cossars, Wing Lancers, and Snow Leopards, they're just not going to stand up uh, to the many foes she has in her campaign. Furthermore, Catherine is kind of worthless as a Legendary Lord. The only real benefit she has is that she gets uh, upkeep minus 50% for Ice Guard, as well as 8% ward safe. Yes, she does get the diplomatic benefit to Kislevi factions. Funnily enough, Borosursus gets an even bigger benefit, so Daddy knows how to play this game. Her magic tree is just not worth using. I'm not saying it's completely crap, but let me emphasize this point. It is better if you're getting a Tempest Mage through the Ice Court than to actually use Katrin's entire sp uh, skill line. Don't get me wrong, there are certainly some spells that you may want to use, especially the ones affected by the Ice Mistress situation. But think of this. This just literally reduces all this does. Think on this. You're reducing the Winds of Magic cost of all spells by 10%. Okay. So take Heart of Winter as an example. It's 24 Winds of Magic. 10%, that's 22. Just an idea. Or um, or Crystal Sanctuary, not really worth it. But let's say Heart of Winter, a spell that's actually worth uh, using. And if you get it, uh, if you get it to tier two, it will be it will be um, it, it will be 22. You reduce it by 20, uh, 10%. You're looking at, what, 20, uh, 20 wins of magic. And then 19. That's all of Katrin's benefit. She reduces the wins of magic cost of a spell that might be worth using by free. You want to know what makes a good caster? I'll just give you an idea of what makes a good caster. Draz of the Ashen, who has one of the most powerful spells in the game, and he can spam it like a fireball. In terms of wins of magic cost. That's a good caster. And he has the entire melee skill line as well. And a much better mount option. And a better army effect as well. Ice guards are not great units. You can use a couple of them. But as a Kisavai, in a Kisavai campaign. What you really want to do. Is you want to get. Uh, like here are the units you want to get in a Kisavai campaign. You can get like four ice guards. But any more is just a waste of time. For range prowess. Like a. Full-on Kisavite army would have like four Ice Guard, four Streltsy, and then a bunch of Tsarguard, uh, Tsarguard and War Sleds. Maybe some War Bearer Riders, maybe some other units, but you do really want to get Tsarguard. Funnily enough, for a, a faction that's supposed to be about the hybrid units, the dedicated melee units are actually some of the best units that you have. Well, we could count the heavy War Sleds as being good units, but you don't, you don't want to mass War Sleds. Like, you want to get four Ice Guard, four Streltsy, four War Sleds, you're already looking at 12, you had three, uh, two heroes and the lord, so you're looking at 15, you got five slots. What should you use those five slots for? Mm, I don't know, five star guard. Or maybe even forgo some of those strelts, you only go with two strelts, you only go with two ice guard. Or get some artillery as well, because you're going to want them for sieges. Getting strelts, like strelts do more damage, of course strelts have the issue of line of sight, but... That's why you don't mass gunpowder units as any faction, not even the Castle Orbs, who have much superior gunpowder units than Kislev can do, can have in their campaign. Making a full Ice Guard army for Katrin, yes, it will be cheap and it will be better than an army of Kossars, sure, but not as, as much as you might necessarily think. And even with the upkeep benefit, they're still more expensive than Kossars. Certainly better, but the problem with Ice Guard is like, the range ability is okay, but not fantastic. And the issue is 
if they get engaged in melee, they're just gonna collapse in a pile on the floor. Like, that's the reason you want to get Sarkar. I mean, hell, the heavy war sleds will decimate most many enemies in a pure on melee fight, let alone the fact they can run around in circles around them, shooting at them. Just an idea. So, Katrin's focus in her campaign is bad in, in a lot of ways. The reason Castaltin works better, beyond the fact that he starts with a tier 2 Salmon, so that means he can get armored Kossars very quickly in his campaign, and he has a better starting army, and he starts with Patriarch, is that Castaltin buffs the melee ability of those armored Kossars, which you're going to be using in a, lot, in a lot of armies early on, and he also gets ward safe for Patriarch, so he makes Patriarchs more durable. Now, Realms Chaos Castaltin sucked because he then starts with the city and he had issues getting uh, any of the Kisavai cities. Like, if you're playing Catrin in Realms Chaos, you could get all of the Kisavai cities within like 10, 15, 20 turns, depending on how you played it. As Castaltin, good luck with that, because you are obviously not going to gain the Kisav city. Furthermore, just to just to compound how awful Katrin is, Kislev as a city, yes, this is hilarious for Kislev as a race, Kislev as a city is actually the worst city of Kislev. Like, let me uh, let me explain why this is. If we look at the landmarks that Aaron Grant has, forget the port, right? The temple, not particularly that great, right? But the Frost Home, that is a completely different situation. You get hero capacity for Frost Maidens, you get hero and lord recruit rank, and you get the ability of recruiting war slides. And you also get the 20% income from all buildings from the Linsk Bridge. If you look at Kislev landmarks, the, you could obviously get the Boca Palace, which gives you an upkeep benefit for Ice Guard even further, sure, and gives you Tsar Guard and Ice Guard recruitment. That's not too bad. But you can obviously recruit those units anyway through just you know regular recruitment buildings at, well, I mean, you, you do save a tier to get the... Uh, the, the glaive uh, the glaive ice guard though swords can be pretty good like the glaives are anti-large the uh, the swords are anti-infantry you may want to get a lot of swords regardless in your campaign what about sargard sargard are a tier free in it so not really too much lost with respect to that oh but Prague you know Prague takes the cake Prague gives you uh, gives you some pretty damn sweet benefits when you're looking at it because it also gives you plus uh two hero and lord recruit rank hero capacity for patriarch hero recruitment for patriarch through the magnus gardens and also gives you global uh, recruitment capacity plus one and global recruitment duration minus one Prague is a much much better setting than kislev like the temple of ursin not really worth it. Late game, very late game, sure, absolutely. The Grand Citadel, it is controlled, but you're not really going to struggle with that, especially not as Katrin. I mean, what's the point of giving a landmark that buffs your control as the faction that has the most control of all of the key Soviet legendary lords? Not really beneficial. So, Katrin has the worst landmarks, the worst city, the worst starting situation, the worst starting army, the worst lord effects, the, wor the worst faction effects. And she's also very limited by supporters. I would rather play a, ca a campaign as Casaltan. And we're not even finished. No, no, no. If you think that I'm finished with, Ka with Catherine and just uh, explaining how awful she is, no. She also is awful because of where she starts in. Okay, so she's got the Southern Oblast over here. Guess who borders her, right? You have Draika, who is an absolutely insane force of nature. I fear Draika more than I fear Grimgor in a campaign. And Grimgor is absolutely nothing to sneeze at. The best way to deal with Draika is to just take her settlement, remove her unit recruitment, and then pray you can catch her army in a good position where you can just auto resolve against her. Because if you have to actually fight her in a manual battle, you're going to get screwed. If you're playing as Azak, as the Greenskins, just to give you an idea, you better have two full armies with Waz attached to them to deal with Draka in a direct confrontation. And she might still win even in that circumstance, just to ex understand how awful she is. But no, as Katrin, you don't just have to deal with Draka. No, 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 no. You have to deal with Draka and Azak, potentially. Now, you can avoid it. My tip, 
Strong tip. Don't engage in any diplomacy with Astromark. Don't touch the Astromark. The Astromark does not exist. The Astromark belongs to Azag and Draika, and you've got other things to deal with. But, obviously, that means that you're playing this entire early game campaign with the Doom with the Apocalypse timer ticking, because eventually someone's gonna win that war between Azag and Draika, and you better pray that it actually is Draika, because Azag is actually worse in a lot of ways if he gets to a higher level and throws four Waz at you. You, you gotta pray on that. And here's the thing, Azag and Draika are optional to deal with. The main threats of this campaign are Frat, Azazel, and Trog. Warriors of Chaos are one of the most powerful races in the game. Skaven are absolutely insane to deal with because they'll throw massed armies against you and can ambush you as you're moving from settlement to settlement. And Trog might unite all of Norska. Or the best part is he might not. He, you might actually defeat him, then Wolfric unites all of Norska and starts sending doom stacks against you. That's your campaign situation. You're expecting Castalton to do anything for you? Guess again. It's actually much better to play Boris Ursus because Catherine will hold her own when controlled by the AI with all the money, cash to replenishment, growth that the AI gets. Necessary. Or if you're playing Castalton, the reason Castalton's campaign is much better is you don't have to worry about Azag, you don't have to worry about Festus, all you have to deal with are half of the legendary lords that Catrin might have to deal with at a certain point. And you can easily wipe out Azazel, well, not so easily, it's a tough battle, but just that, a tough battle. It's not a tough campaign, you just defeat uh, you just declare war on Azazel, like you go to the Tower Crack, to the Brotherhood of the Bear, you get paid to declare war on Azazel, Azazel is going to come for you to attack you. When he does so, you just wipe him out in a field battle. Casalhan well. has the ability of doing so. Once you finish that, you can just take the Tower Crack back, give it to the Brotherhood of the Bear, and have them hold the line for at least a bit, then focus on Frot, uh, then focus on, on Trog. Or not even do that, really. You can just sell help it to the dwarf to crack a drug, and sell a troll country to crack a drug, and you'll have them do it for you. Then take over Prague, because Prague has good relations with Castalton. That's the fun part of Castalton. Or if you're playing Boris Ursus, the brilliant part is you take your settlement, you go to the Frozen Landing, um, you establish Colindale, you try and hold the Tower Tournament for as much as possible, and you, start, and you start taking settlements over here in the Goromandi Mountains, selling them to Prague, you'll get a military alliance with them, then you declare war on, on Frat, who will wipe uh, Prague out, he won't take the city, but he'll wipe out their armies, then you'll confederate Prague, then march on Frat, wipe him out, simple, a simple, a simple situation. So yeah, Castalton uh, uh, and Boris Ursus are much better. Catrin is just awful to play. She needs a hero. She needs a better campaign situation. She needs a higher level city. And Kislev needs to be vastly improved as a race for her to be viable. For the Lizardman is without a doubt Lord Mazdamundi. I think Mazdamundi did certainly suffer for being one of the initial legendary lords for the Lizardman. And he is such a disappointment as a character. Forget the fact that he is the worst legendary lord for his entire race, that every other legendary lord is substantially better than he he has better campaigns, better campaign mechanics, better battle effects. I mean Mazda Mundi is such a huge disappointment. Look at him, he's kind of sleeping over there. I'd like to believe in the fantasy that Mazda Mundi isn't really fully lucid because he just wipe out all of his enemies with a single spell. You gotta understand why Mazamundi is so disappointing in the game compared to the lore. This guy is one of the most powerful beings in the entire world. He is so powerful that the mountain range you see over here? Yeah, he created it. Actually, he created the entire Isthmus of Lustria with his mind. When the Skaven blew up the moon while they were invading Lustria and they couldn't win because of Mazamundi, when the Skaven blew up the moon to annihilate the world, it was Mazdamundi who almost saved it. Until the gods of chaos basically interfered to stop him and kill him. And they did. They did succeed in that respect. Think of the power of Mazdamundi that it literally took all four chaos gods to be able to put an end to him and an exploding moon courtesy of the Skaven. Then you under, have to understand just how much of a disappointment he is as a character. I mean, Teclas is a disappointment as a caster, but 
Teclas is jun the junior student compared to Mazda Mundi in terms of magical ability. He does get the banishment spell. He does have some decent spell, spell, spell abilities over here. But his magic tree, his entire magic tree, is just a huge letdown compared to what we would expect in the lore for Maz uh, uh, from Mazda Mundi. <laughs> I mean, like Creative Assembly has shown that they can do this better. They showed it with Lord Croak over here. That, well, you start with Lord Croak when you play as Gorak. Gorak doesn't have him otherwise. So, a huge letdown in the campaign, a huge letdown in Total War Warhammer. Now, the Lizardmen are going to get the rework, but until, and hopefully at that point, Mazda Mundi will finally be the powerful magic user he's meant to be then we got norska norska is not a great faction at the moment though there is a rework planned apparently by creative assembly hopefully with a new ledger and lord or a pack of ledger and lords because norska absolutely needs it the campaign dynamic that currently that norska currently has isn't really a great one but out of the two legend legendary lords that we currently have, certainly Wolfric is the worst choice. Now, faction wide effects, he gets 15 melee attack for mammoth units and 15% upkeep for marauder units. Now, melee attack for mammoths is all well and good. It's a pretty substantial and solid benefit. Here's the problem that Wolfric does have. He literally starts with nothing. He starts with a tier one settlement with not even a barracks to his name. That's how bad uh, he is at the beginning of a campaign so you're gonna have to spend some time growing your settlement before you're able to do anything in your campaign sure you can recruit marauders and marauder spearmen in your campaign from the start but basically you will have a pretty pathetic and weak early game army i mean you do have some marauder champions mammoth marauder horsemen etc but your early game situation is very very weak and that's never a good thing in any particular campaign Yes, you can wipe out uh, the yearlings and take over the troll fjord over here. Sure, no problem. And then you get to deal with the uh, the mountains of Nagalfari, or however you pronounce that. The Marauder upkeep benefit is nice, but even so, Marauders are still expensive units, and ultimately, the trolls that Trog does get are just flat out better units simple as that like compare a marauder champion which by the way it still takes a quite a bit to recruit compare a marauder champion with trolls and you know which one wins out when it comes uh, when it comes to it though to be fair marauder champions are pretty damn good in battle especially because they get all these benefits um uh, if they're engaged in melee or with berserkers who also get a lot of benefits in a battle uh, with more time spent in melee these guys will punch way 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 above their weight but still, plenty of problems uh, for them. Now, Wolfric also gets fear. Oh, yes, that's great for his entire army. Thankful. That is pretty decent, but not really too substantial as Norska, considering, you know, you've got plenty of, uh, plenty of choices with respect to that. Like, you know, the trolls that will do that for you. And not just the trolls, to be clear. There, there's more than just trolls. There's the femurs. There, uh, there's the femur units, the frost worm, all of those things available. Um, the mammoth, which actually has terror, like the mammoths that you're buffing. So actually causing fear on your entire army is not really that big of a deal as Norska. For some other factions, it would be pretty substantial, but not for Norska. You do have the ability of hunting now champions, and this is pretty good because it allows you to eliminate lords and bows. You do have uh, the Sea Fang ability, which is a pretty solid enough ability. And you cause terror, a minus 15% upkeep for your entire army, construction cost and construction time for your provincial, um, for province capital settlement buildings. And then you get casualty replenishment plus 50% for this lord. Um, and then Hunter of Champions, which just reduces armor, melee defense, and prevents them from moving pretty great ability so he's really a lord and hero killer killer that is a great benefit but really i think trog is just the substantially better choice i mean in the long very long term with a lot of mammoths sure but the marauder upkeep benefit yeah the troll benefit that trog gets is just the better decision 
And that's it, Costine signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications. If you do enjoy my content, consider supporting me via PayPal or 